the passage of scripture that I'm going to read is uh, from 2 Peter chapter 3. <clears throat> I hope I'm not pulling a trick on you here, but uh, I was going to read verses 1 through 14, but we're going to focus on verses 7 through 14. Is that going to be a problem? Okay. Um, I wanted to put that text in its context, but we will focus primarily upon verses 7 through 14. Beginning in verse 1, 2 Peter chapter 3. The Apostle Peter says, This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, <coughs> walking after their own lust, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. It is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burnt up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of God? wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according unto his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found in him of peace without spot and blameless. Amen. Beloved people of God, how we ought to be much con contemplating the coming of the day of the Lord. When we say the day of the Lord here in this passage. It's, it's speaking of the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is uh, something that uh, we should continually uh, be looking for joyfully. As the scripture says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verses 16 through 18 that the Lord in that day in the day of the Lord or it's also said the day of God God who has created the heavens and the earth with his word, it, the scripture says. He created it by his word. And he spoke. 
and all that is created was brought into existence that, that exists. And God has continued for these several millennia to watch over and, and care for the earth, even though it is in its fallen condition. But the hope of this passage is, is that this fallen earth and, and the heavens are going to all pass away and that there is going to come a new heaven or new heavens and a new earth. And I like that short phrase at the end where it says, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Just imagine what it must be like uh, in that new heavens and new earth uh, not to have sin within us, around us, constantly uh, being uh, an uh, affliction to us. The Apostle Paul speaks of that affliction of sin within, even as a, a believer, even as an apostle. Romans 7. Oh, the things that I would, do, I would do, I do not, but that which I hate, that I do. No more of that in the new heavens and the new earth, because there is nothing but Righteousness, no sin. Oh, what a glorious day it will be when, as the scripture says, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. You know, we have uh, heard some speak of a, a secret rapture. But everywhere I speak, I, I, I hear of the coming of the Lord. It's always uh, with the trump of God or it's uh, with the, the sound or voice of the archangel. Uh, nothing quiet about that or secret. Uh, and uh, the Lord will come with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall be raised first. Then we which are alive and remain uh, shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, to meet the Lord in the air. This is so glorious for us to consider. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. We have our eyes focused horizontally so much that uh, we forget sometimes in our circumstances that all of these things and the troubles that uh, we're dealing with will all be taken away. We need more of a, a vertical uh, look in our life, a look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. There's a question in the Heidelberg Catechism, question 52. Paul says, comfort yourself with these words. What words? The words, the coming of the Lord. And uh, in regards to that coming of the Lord, um, the Heidelberg Catechism asks, what comfort is it to thee that Christ in the day of the Lord shall come to judge the living and the dead? That the Lord is coming to judge all that have passed on this earth. And the answer is the comfort to us is this in that day of the Lord, in the coming of the Lord, is this that in all my sorrows and persecutions now, that I may with uplifted head look for the self same one who before offered himself, that is our Lord Jesus Christ, he offered himself for me to the judgment of God, and he has removed all curse from me. As we partake of the Lord's Supper, the meaning of this to us is that through the shed blood and the crucified body of the Lord Jesus Christ, that curse has been removed. Yes, we have remaining sin, that uh, we deal with, but uh, the, the contemplation of the day of God, the day of the Lord, ought to be continually in our thoughts, and it ought to be our comfort. We need to look beyond our immediate circumstances and, and know in our heart that the better days are yet to come. I love those words because they are so true. 
the better days for the believer are yet to come. And so we know that the Lord is coming and we look for him to come in judgment and to remove all curse from me. And he's coming as judge from heaven. And he then will take vengeance upon our enemies and the enemies of Christ and of his church. And he will cast all his and our enemies into everlasting condemnation. But when Jesus comes back in that day of the Lord, he will take me with all his chosen ones to himself into heavenly joy and glory. There's three things I want us to note here in the verses 7 through 14. The latter part of that scripture I just read in 2 Peter chapter 3. Uh, the first thing that I would like for us to note in verses 7 through 9 in this, that is this, that the day of the Lord is a day of judgment against the heavens, the earth, and ungodly men. This fallen earth and the heavens included. Note in verses 7 through 9, <clears throat> Paul said he was taken up to the third heaven. So there is a sense in which uh, there is a plurality when we speak of heaven. And in verse 7 it says, But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire. God, by his word, brought in the judgment of the flood. And for those who would deny that there is a flood are foolish. They are not believing the word and facts as they are. Because if they don't believe in a flood, they're not going to believe that this world is going to be destroyed by fire. But in verse 7, is that not what Peter says? That this present world and earth as we know it uh, will be destroyed by fire. It is kept in store. The word is actually, it's actually prepared. This earth is we make so much about this earth, and even in its fallen state, there's so much good that God has uh, in this present earth for uh, us to enjoy. But there's a far better earth, there's, as we'll see as we read a new heavens and a new earth uh, God uh, will create. But we need to think about further down uh, time and where time is leading us to. It's leading us to the destruction of the present heavens and the earth. This earth is reserved unto the judgment uh, with fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. And so uh, that's why the scripture tells us uh, not to take vengeance upon our enemies. God says, Judgment is mine, I will recompense. So when you were tempted uh, to retaliate or get vengeance against those who afflict us, just find comfort in this. Know this, that the day is coming when the Lord is going to rectify these things. So we need to be patient in whatever afflictions that the world may uh, throw at us. So this day of judgment we see in verses 7 through 9 is a day in which God will destroy the present heavens and earth and ungodly men. Now, earlier 
and that was one of the reasons I wanted to read the preceding verses here in chapter 3. It speaks about scoffers that scoff at the thought of God coming in judgment. And they reason it's been so long since God has his words been saying that this judgment is coming that they come right out and are bold, uh, uh, very brazen, to deny the judgment. If it hasn't come in these several millennia, how can we expect that it will come at all, is their argument. That's the argument of the unbeliever. And so that's why the scripture here says that with the Lord is... Uh, that uh, a day with the Lord is as a thousand years. God lives uh, in eternity. He's everywhere present, of course, in time, but he is also uh, living in, as some said, an eternal present. But he is going to bring to pass here in time the judgment that is due uh, for its Rebellion, the earth's rebellion against God. And uh, though it may be several millennia before th that judgment comes, we must remember that God lives in eternity. And so he transcends time. And so if he takes uh, however many thousands of years the, the earth has been here, before that judgment comes since the fall, it to him is as one day because God is timeless. He, he's the eternal God. That's one of his attributes is, etern is eternity. And when people think that, well, since God hasn't brought this judgment these many millennia, it's not going to come. They're making God to fit into the mold of the creation. God transcends his creation. And so it may take several millennia, but the day is appointed when he will come. Now I want us to note in verse 9 how that <clears throat> Peter says here that God is not slack concerning his promise. That, that is, that he will uh, bring judgment upon the, the present heavens and, and earth. That is, he will not be delinquent. Uh, we uh, human beings often are tardy or, or are delinquent. But God isn't. He is not slack. The promise will be fulfilled. And he goes on to say, Peter does, that the reason so much time has lapsed from our perception is that God is long-suffering to us creatures. Why is he long-suffering? He's being long-suffering and not bringing that judgment yet because all of the elect have not yet been called. God has set a time, and that time will not come before or after that time that is set. And Peter is telling us that God, it's because of the long-sufferingness of God that it has not come already. It's not that it won't come, but it hasn't come because he is not willing that any of his elect Perish. So many people use this verse to show that every uh, that God is not willing that uh, any anybody uh, should uh, uh, be condemned to hell. But we know very clearly that God's waiting and His being long suffering is that not all of the elect have yet been called to repentance. He's not willing. He's long-suffering to usward. 
And that's really the key word here in, in uh, interpreting verse 9. He's long-suffering to usward. Who is the usward? The usward are the people of God, the, the elect of God. He's long-suffering to usward, not willing that uh, any of, of his elect should perish, but that all should come unto uh, repentance. So, indeed, the Lord will come. The day of the Lord will come. As our Lord says in Matthew 25, 31, the Son of Man shall come in His glory. And, uh, you know, uh, we, we ought to really meditate upon these words. Uh, God has given us these words that we, we may think upon them and so that we can, in our mind, understand uh, what His plan is. And that is for the Son of Man, that is the Lord Jesus Christ, to come in glory, and he's going to come with all of his holy angels and all the elect uh, with him that are in heaven will come as well. And then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. That day of the Lord, the day of his coming is a day when God will set up the judgment seat that we read about in the book of the Revelation the white throne judgment. Unto the righteous he shall say in that day, as our Lord so clearly articulated in Matthew 25, 21. In that day, in that day of the Lord, uh, he will say unto the righteous, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. And so what awaits the believer is eternal joy. We will forever be praising him. But to the unrighteous, the scripture says, he will say, depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And, and so these words are given to us so that we may prepare for that day of God, that day of the Lord that is coming. The Lord will come, it says in 2 Peter 3, 7. And the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved or preserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But we should also note how that the coming of the Lord is going to be a, a time in which <clears throat> the Lord, when he comes, uh, he will come visibly. The day of the Lord, though, will come unexpectedly. It's the scoffer and those who tell lies against the scripture that make people put off or think about preparing for that day. But what we want to note uh, in, from verse uh, 10 and following is that the day of the Lord will come secretively at it, it, will not, it is not known when he will come. The scripture says not even the Son of Man knows the day and the hour in which that day he will come to bring that judgment. But the day of the Lord will come, it says in verse 10. And it will come, as, as we want to note secondly, as a thief in the night. A thief comes unexpectedly and tries to spoil uh, the individual's goods that he might enrich himself. And so what we see here, our Lord Jesus Christ is saying, he's coming, but you don't know when. But what we are told here is also to be ready. 
He will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are in shall therein shall be burned up. And that we know. You know, there was a time uh, before the flood where <clears throat> Noah, as he was building the ark, and the people around heard him hammering away, building that ark, and many were unprepared, and we know that there were only eight souls that were saved. There were many then who would not believe that such a thing could happen, that there could be a global flood and destroy all of the creation. And now the Lord is saying, there is a judgment coming, a day of the Lord, when there's going to be a destruction of the present heavens and the earth. And it's going to come in such a way that you, when you least expect it. And so the... Uh, Exhortation here is to be ready. Verse 11, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. It's, it's unfathomable that we can imagine uh, this great earth just melting away with fervent heat and being destroyed. Not only the earth, but the heavens as well. Reserved by what? By the word of God, just as the flood was reserved also by the word of God. As he spoke that word, creation into existence, so he spoke it out of existence with the flood. And it's going to be spoken out of existence. Uh, though the globe was here and the flood, yet uh, in this second destruction of the heavens and the earth, this present earth will be completely destroyed and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. So the exhortation is that seeing these things shall be dissolved. Why should we set our hearts so much upon the things of the earth? We should set our heart upon the things that are above. Setting our heart upon uh, the Lord and glorifying Him in the time that He has given us here. Think about it. What manner of persons ought we to be is the question here in verse 11. Seeing that all of these things will be destroyed, it should be a warning to us that we should now be living in a holy walk, or as it says, holy conversation and godliness. We should be living godly lives and looking looking for and hastening into that uh, glorious day of God when he will appear manifest himself in power and a great glory and so beloved let us know that this day of the Lord though the scoffers scoff at it it will indeed come and it will come uh, unexpectedly even as a thief in the night. God created the heavens and the earth, and God also has said that he will take away that which he has created, and that in the day of the Lord. So the earth also, and the works that are there, therein will be burned up. That is, along with all the inhabitants of the earth, the works of man, his deeds, accomplishments, the construction of physical structures that have been built all over this planet, all these things will be destroyed. Nothing will be able to endure uh, that destruction that is coming in the day of the Lord. And so, thirdly, in verses 11 through 14, Peter tells us then that we as the saints of God need to be looking. We ought to be living our lives with uh, eager anticipation and preparation for the day of the Lord. 
It is coming when we do not know. But it is, as is so clearly declared to us in numerous scriptures of the New Testament and in the Old as well. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says, The very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray your whole spirit, soul, and body will be preserved blameless. So that's what we should be focusing upon in this present evil world. We ought to be concerned about our country and our leaders, and we need to pray for them, the Apostle Paul says. But our chief concern is in that day, will we be among the blameless? That is, those who have been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. We are preserved through him and will be preserved when the Lord does come in that day of judgment. In verse 12, the scripture says, we are to be looking for and hastening, having a desire for the hastening of that day of God to come. Wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Titus chapter 2 verse 13 also in speaking of this eager anticipation that we ought to have for the, for the day of the Lord or as uh, Peter says the day of God. Titus says of believers you ought to have this eager anticipation of Christ coming, looking for that blessed hope that is the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Why should we be looking for that wonderful day of our Lord's coming? The reason that we are looking for the coming of the Lord is that uh, we might be with him. He has declared that he is going to prepare a place for us. And he says, if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back and receive you unto myself. And so we ought to be looking for that day. We ought to also be looking for the coming of the Lord that we might be delivered from this present evil world. You know, um, I was just contemplating, uh, and as perhaps many of you uh, and are concerned about things that are going on in our own country these days, and uh, we should have a concern and we should pray uh, for uh, God's blessing upon our land and upon our leaders. But we know that the end is this, that the Lord is coming back and he's going to take us to a better place. Now that doesn't mean that we ought to uh, sit back in our recliner and just wait for that day to come. We are to, we are to be busily engaged in the work of the furtherance of the kingdom of God. But know that when that day comes, that's a day that we shall forever be with the Lord. What comforting words are those to us? How comforting they are. In verse 13, Peter says, the creating of a new heavens and a new earth is according to God's promise. And we know it is coming because Isaiah himself also speaks of a new heaven and a new earth. Isaiah 65, verses 17 through verse 19. Isaiah 66, verse 22, speaks of the new heavens and the new earth, for in dwelleth righteousness. Just think about it. In that place, there will be no presence of sin in that new heavens and new earth. There will be no power of sin within us or around us to tempt us. 
we will forever uh, be with the Lord. Seeing then that the Lord has these things reserved for us, what man or person ought to we to be? Verse 14, Peter says, Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent. Be, be diligent. Uh, in your uh, reading of the scriptures and study of the word of God and prayer, be diligent in the means of grace as we partake of the Lord's Supper. This is one means that God uses to strengthen our faith as we partake of the Lord's Supper. So in this time that we await the coming of the Lord and we anticipate his coming with joy, uh, our, we should be uh, using the various means of grace, his word and prayer and the sacraments for the strengthening of our faith because we don't know what lay ahead for us in the years to come. But we do know that for believers, it's going to be glorious. What God has reserved for us. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace. Peace with others. We should not let the sun go down on our wrath. That is, even in this day, we should not. If we know that there's offense, we should try to remedy by the grace of God that offense. Peace with our brethren and peace mainly with God. That we might continue on living holy by the grace of God and unblameable lives. That's what God has called us to do. And so I know uh, my heart's troubled as I look around uh, the way things are in our country and, and I look at things around the world. Just remember that man is not in control. That God is in control of all of these things. What we should be concerned about is that right standing that we have uh, with the Lord and that uh, he will take us to be with him and the world can't lay their hands on us. No one can take us from the Father's hand. Jesus, as uh, he was telling his disciples that uh, he must go from them in John 14, their hearts were troubled because Jesus was telling them that uh, he uh, would be taken from them, and later uh, they found out what he meant, that uh, he would be put on the cross and, and taken. Uh, and, of course, he was here 40 days on the earth after the resurrection, and now he is ascended into heaven and seated at the right hand of God. And, and uh, he encouraged his disciples in those troubling times when he said, I will be taken from you. He said, let not your heart be troubled. He knew what their hearts were experiencing. They were, they were anxious. They were uh, unsettled. And they began to think, well, if, what are we going to do if, if the Lord is not here with us? And Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. And that's what I would leave you with here this evening as we think about the day of God, as we think about the day of the Lord that is coming and uh, we uh, have been reconciled through faith who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me, Jesus says. In my Father's house are many mansions. Oh, it's just unfathomable what God has prepared for those who love and serve him. And Jesus tells his disciples, if these things that I am going to prepare a place for you, if they were not so, he said, I would have told you. But he said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. And this is, this is what we should be thinking about. Uh, there shouldn't be a day go by that we shouldn't think about. The Lord is coming. And uh, 
We should think about it for our own comfort, but we should think about it when we think about our loved ones who may not yet be in the faith. We ought to pray uh, for our loved ones that God may call them to salvation. It's a very healthy state of mind uh, when we keep our thoughts on the coming of the Lord. What has God prepared for us? 1 Corinthians 2.9 says, the Apostle Paul caught up to the third heaven, caught up to paradise, who wrote 1 Corinthians, says in chapter 2, verse 9, I hath not seen nor ear heard, it's neither entered into the heart of man the things that God hath prepared for them that love him. Apostle John in Revelation 21, verse 1, was given a glimpse of the new heavens and the new earth. In Revelation 21, that would be good to read that passage, those first four verses. In a vision he saw the new heaven and the new earth. Revelation 21, 1 through 4. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. This is what's coming after this present earth and heavens are destroyed. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth who passed away and there was no more sea. Now I've thought much on that phrase there and there was no more sea. Uh, is that to be taken uh, parabolically? There will be no more trouble because uh, in scripture the seas often uh, symbolize uh, trouble. But the more I think about it, the more uh, it may well be saying that there will be no more uh, seas or ocean. You know, the ocean takes up more space on this planet than, than land. And uh, we read in Genesis 1.10 in the creation, it says, And God called the, the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called the seas. So when it says, Scripture says there's no more sea, it would be that uh, there will be no more uh, ocean as we know it in that new heavens and in the new earth. I, John, saw the holy city. I saw the new Jerusalem, John says, coming down from God, out of heaven prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. We have been alienated by sin from God. Now, redemption being completed in the second coming of the Lord. The new heavens and the new earth. God tabernacles, presences himself with his people. And he will dwell with his people. They shall be his people and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrows nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And so knowing these things, beloved, here, then the closing of the book of the Revelation in chapter 22, Verses 20 and 21, Jesus Christ testifieth these things, John says. And he says, surely I come quickly. Amen. And the response of John is, even so, come, Lord Jesus. Beloved, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all.